Good morning, church. Our theme for the year has been capturing the heartbeat of God. How better to explore the heart of God than by looking at someone that God says is a man after his own heart. Before we even know David's name in Scripture, we know that he's a man after God's own heart. And that fact is repeated in both the Old and the New Testament, in the books of Samuel and also in Acts. I've been asking people all week, what do you think that means? What do you think it means that David was a man after God's own heart? That's the question we're going to explore in our lesson this morning. We're going to explore this question because whatever it means, there is a reason why God said it. There is, there's got to be much for us to learn. And so we're going to spend some time asking, what, what did it mean that David was a man after God's own heart? The text for today's lesson will actually come from 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st Kings, and 1st Chronicles. We're not going to be doing much reading today, but referring back to the stories from David's life. Found in these books and, and references found in other places. Um, much is said about David in the, in the Bible. It's arguable that he is talked about more than any other Bible character. I think it's important to say that God uses messed up people to work His purposes. Thank you, God, for not presenting us with a group of heroes and Bible characters who were perfect. But they are heroes. And we can learn from the faith of Abraham and the repentance of Paul despite their flaws. Their flaws actually give us hope. David committed adultery, murder, and his family was a mess. So how is he a man after God's own heart? Well, he was not in those moments. We see the heart of David as we examine the totality of his life, his actions, his attitudes, and the same can be said about our own hearts. Don't judge me on my best or my worst day. And I would also add that you can see the heart of God in how David repented after he was confronted with his sin. Before we get into the, the, the meat of the lesson, let's talk about a few things just about David himself. Um, Samuel goes to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the next king of Israel. Samuel saw the oldest, Eliab, and thought, surely here is the one. But God told Samuel something interesting. He said, man looks to the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, 1 Samuel 16:7. For us today, as we examine ourselves and our own hearts, that can be both comforting and disturbing all at the same time, but mostly comforting that God knows our hearts. Some other things about, Daniel, about David. He's also mentioned among the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and it is said that the world was not worthy of those individuals. Now that is a bold tribute. And it's, a, and it's great to know that David was in that list. David was described to King Saul when he was being introduced to him as a brave man and a warrior who speaks well and is good looking and God is with him. David inspired those around him. He's called Israel's shepherd and Israel's singer of songs. His own men called him the lamp of Israel. They would do anything. There was this time when he simply wanted to drink and they were in the middle of a war and three of his mighty men heard him say it, they went and broke through the enemy lines just to go get him a drink of water and bring it back. David inspired people. He still inspires us today when we look at the Psalms that he wrote. So he was an amazing person with an amazing heart. So what are some of the ways we see that David's heart was like the heart of God? Well. One of the first things I came up with was that David is creative. David wrote most of the Psalms. He's one of the greatest poets of all time. He was a gifted architect, military strategist, politician, and yet a warrior, shepherd, and king. Not bad, right? Kind of sounds like a Renaissance man. But you can see that he was a creative person 
And in many ways, you see that reflected in him, but you know it's true of God. Just look at God's creation and you see God's creativity and the diversity that's in the world. The heart of God is alive with creativity and adventure. And I think he and David shared that. David was a fierce warrior. We know that he killed Goliath and he, they used to sing the songs about Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands. We do not tend to think of God in that way, but we're told that he is a fierce warrior in both Exodus and in Jeremiah. A shepherd, David cared for sheep. He fought off the lion and the bear, but also he cared for the nation of Israel as a shepherd. And we know that Jesus is called the great shepherd. David was a worshiper. He longed for God's presence and was willing to make a fool of himself to show his joy for God. We sometimes cannot even muster a smile during worship. David was absolutely into his worship and longed for God's presence. I would think it is safe to say that God longs for our presence. He's a father after all. There's a popular song that says, he didn't want heaven without us. And every time I hear it, it makes me smile. God gave feasts and celebrations in the old law as times of worship and joy. We know that in heaven, God surrounds himself with rejoicing and worshiping. And upon his return, among other things, there will be worshiping and a great feast. One of the other things that, that occurs to me is that David was emotional and tenderhearted. There was a, a, one of the Psalms where he wrote, um, I believe it was Psalm 16, I flood my bed with tears. This is written by a warrior, but he also had this amazing tender heart. He loved deeply, and so he could be hurt deeply. I think we all understand that, and the same is true of God. David was also generous. He was known for his gifts and his generosity. He set aside much of what was eventually used to build the temple in Jerusalem. He would often share the spoils of war with others around him when he could have claimed them all for himself. And we are all very well aware of God's generosity and just how generous our God is. So again, a reflection of the heart of God through the heart of David. One of the things that hit me the most was that David was long-suffering. Twice David had his opponent, King Saul, in a defenseless position, and David let him go. I would have taken Saul out and ended the entire battle. Certainly many of us would have taken out David's rebellious son, Absalom. David kept allowing bad behavior, and many others paid the price for it. But you know what? I'm glad that my God is long-suffering and full of grace and even when I fail in colossal and costly ways, his grace is enough. David grieved. David cried and mourned over his friends and his sons that died. God has grief for us when we separate ourselves from him. We see this in the parable of the prodigal son, the father looking to the horizon, longingly, hoping, waiting that his son would come back. God would do and give anything to bring us back to him. David grieved so much that his men, after stopping Absalom, grew weary of David's mourning. They claimed that he loved those who hated him and that he hated those who loved him. Well, they were half right. He and thankfully God love those who hate him. We know what Jesus said on the cross. The apostle Peter tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. So we see so much of the heart of God reflected in David, and I think we can learn from both. One of the things that David was, was he was approachable. David allowed the common people of the land to approach him with their problems. He allowed Nathan, the prophet, to chew him out. He allowed soldiers to openly disagree with him. And you know what? He listened. He repented at Nathan's confrontation. He listened to Joab's recommendations and those of his military. Joab had some really hard things to say to David, but David allowed it. He even learned from it. He even followed his own soldier's advice at times. This comes from a humility and a desire to serve and a resting in the assurance that God can and does work his will. We know that God is approachable. He presents himself to us as a father. 
And he tells us that we can approach the throne room, of his throne room, uh, with, with boldness. We can go into the throne room of grace with great boldness. That's amazing that God allows us to do that. What a great God we serve. He was prayerful. Why God is not prayerful. He does want relationship and communication with us. He's a father. The Psalms are a testament to the fact that David had one of the best prayer lives ever. For starters, David constantly inquired of the Lord. Saul did not, and he was blamed for that. In my readings over and over, I kept finding that phrase that David consulted the Lord. He asked the Lord for direction. He told his son Solomon when he was handing over the kingdom, if you seek God, he will be found by you. Not only did he seek God's guidance, David's laments are epic. Over Saul, he uttered, how the mighty have fallen. He fiercely lamented his son with Bathsheba. Over Absalom, Absalom, he cried, Absalom, my son, Absalom, Absalom. He brought everything to God, whether praise, inquiry, petition, lament. He wanted to walk with God as God wants to walk with us. Finally, God knew David, but David knew God. When he numbered the people against God's command, David had to choose his own punishment. It's kind of like go, go, go choose your own switch to be, to, be, to be disciplined with. He had to choose between three years of famine for the land, three months of falling into the hands of his enemies, or three days of plague at the hands of God. David's pretty wise. He chose God. He says why, he also tells us why he chose God. Because of his mercy, and God's mercy is great. Sure enough, God began to punish the nation. And then after a time, right before his angel was about to destroy Jerusalem, he relented because of his mercy. David knew God and his goodness, and he trusted in it. I'm glad that God will be my judge. If you're not a Christian, you should know that what, what David knew, what we all know, that our God is long-suffering. He's merciful. We're told that He doesn't want anyone to perish, but to have life and life abundantly. If you want to know more, we're happy to have a private Bible study with you. Just go to our Contact Us tab on our website at georgetowncoc.org. With all that we've said about David's heart and God's heart, the question is, what is true about me? And my heart, do I have the heart of God? Do I seek God's heart? Now, don't be thinking about others. This is important. Uh, this, this is for us to have self-reflection. We're disciples and followers of Jesus. We bear his name, but do we bear his likeness? It made me think of, I grew up in a small farming community and people would say, you sure are Jerry's son. You look just like him. I uh, can't say I liked it at the time. Uh, I grew to like that idea. Um, but the question is, do you look like your father? Are my prayers like David's prayers? Do I pour my heart out to God? When I speak to God, is there a relationship or a checklist? Am I long-suffering? Am I tender-hearted? Am I joyful and exuberant in worship? Am I generous? Am I approachable? Am I prayerful? Remember where we started. Man looks to the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We should examine ourselves, our hearts, because for the most part, only you and he know what is in your heart. Not only should we examine ourselves, this lesson is not just about looking and, and having self-reflection, but it's also something we could rejoice in. We should rejoice. God put in us a heart and then gave us control or put us in charge of that heart. We're told to guard our hearts, for it is the wellspring of life, Proverbs 4. Further, we are able to change that heart. Although people rarely change, we can. That is the point of the whole Bible, right? I attended a virtual conference last week put on by the Orange folks. And one of the themes of the conference was a question that each one of us were to ask ourselves. When was the last time you changed? Now, if our answer is, I'm saved, I don't need to change, please reconsider. 
Peter tells us that baptism and salvation are milk doctrines. They're not meat, that we should grow up in Christ. Every day, every year, we should be growing to be more like our God. I love that in 2 Peter, we're told that we can be partakers of the divine nature. We can take on God's very nature. And the whole of the New Testament shows us how we can be like Christ, disciples, followers, Christians. So rejoice. Your God is a loving and long-suffering God, not given to criticism, but to hope. Let us lean into God who moved heaven and earth to bring us closer to Him. I hope the lesson's been beneficial to you. It was very beneficial for me to reflect on the heart of David. Uh, We love and miss everyone, but let's go ahead and close the sermon out with a prayer. Father, we thank you for your character, and we ask that you help us to be more like you. Father, help us to avoid a spirit of criticism and judgment, but to embrace your spirit, your spirit of love and kindness and mercy. Help us today, Father, to learn from David and his heart for you. And we pray, Father, that all of those who are far from you, that they may come and and know you and and accept your invitation to a, um, a better life, Uh, here on this earth, but really a better life for eternity, a life with you. We look forward to Jesus' return with great anticipation. We pray by his authority in his name, and, and we recognize that his name is the name above all names. Amen.